Question time. Question time. Question number one. Anthony Cedrone wants to know, does the fear slash annoyance of playing the same chords and melodies ever get to you? I think to a certain extent, melodies and chords and things like that, if they sound similar, then I sort of chalk it up to style. If you listen really to any artist over their career, you'll notice motifs and things that always kind of pop up. And I think that people just develop their own style. That being said, uh, I always try to grow. And I find that if you listen to songs from the first year of Song A Day and you listen to songs um, that I'm writing this year, they'll sound, there'll be some similarities, but I think there's, there's also a lot of differences. And I think one of the major differences is just that you know, I've gotten better over the years. Um, and I think that growth uh, as a songwriter, as a musician or anything like that just comes with doing it. And um, so I don't, I don't worry about it. That's a very long way of saying no. The fear slash annoyance does not get to me. Anthony Cedrone. Okay. Uh, number two, that one guy underscore Jesse wants to know, do you think that you'll be making a song a day the rest of your life? And if you don't, how would you end it? What would be the grand finale? Yes, I do plan on doing it for the rest of my life. So I haven't thought about what a grand finale would be. I have no idea. <laughs> if it ends one day, it's going to end really unceremoniously. It'll just be the last song and that's it. I don't think anything would happen. So until I am incapacitated or I die, uh, I plan to keep doing this. Zal Meister wants to know, have you ever considered posting your songs on Twitter? Yes. As I replied, I do this pretty consistently with, with songs that I think Twitter will respond to. I post them directly to Twitter. Rich wants to know what he should do about his dating issues when the apps and the sites and the meetups don't work. What other options? And I have to say that I do not have any idea, Rich, what what you should do. I will say that I think that what happened for me was that it it ended up being someone that I already knew. It ended up being someone from my past. Maybe go back and and look at who's in your past. I don't know. That's that's the only thing I can really think of. Sorry, buddy. I don't have anything better to say than that. Mr. Small and Loud wants to know, if I buy your bed, will it help? I think that is in response to the are you okay question from last time. I think that's a reference to when I was selling my bed a long time ago. And I actually did. I sold my bed. My bed was sold. That happened. So uh, no, it won't help because now I, I need my bed. Uh, Mr. Small and Loud. Uh, Aaron J asks, what's my favorite song a day? What song means a lot to you or has a lot of the meaning has a lot of meaning to the song? Uh, I get this one a lot. I don't have a favorite song a day song. I would say take a look at the songs that I put onto albums. You can take a look at my Bandcamp page and see the albums that I've put out. That's a pretty good indication that, that I like those song a day songs. So that's a good way to, to sort of get a sense of, of what were my favorites or, or, but the thing is that my favorites change all the time. There's constantly shifting. It's hard. It's hard to choose. It's hard to choose just one. Jonathan wants to know, do you still have a ghost following you telling your story? I have no idea what this is about. Um, maybe, maybe there's a ghost fault following me. Is there a ghost? Is there a ghost back there? Spin Town wants to know, what is your favorite song fight song that you've done? And what is your favorite song, uh, song fight song that someone else has done? So Song Fight is a weekly song competition that's been going since uh, the early 2000s. From roughly 2003 to 2005 or six. I did it quite frequently. Um, and now every once in a while, I'll dip my toe in. Uh, my favorite song fight song that someone else has done, the one that immediately... Uh, leaps to my mind is from um, the fight Lizard Wizard, February of 2004. I was living in New York City at the time. I had just left college. Uh, I really like my song from that week. And that song actually, the song that I made that week actually um, bloomed from that one little song bloomed the Mario opera. But the song that won that fight was by a band called Pompeii. And I always really loved 
their version of Lizard Wizard. And that really um, jumps to my brain. The favorite one that I've ever done, I can't find it right now. And I don't remember the name of it, um, but I'll put it in the description if I can find it. It was one that I did with the Spinto Band when I was living with them. I went on tour with them and uh, as like their tour manager in like 2005 or something, or maybe late 2004. And uh, we did this song in Nashville. One of the guitar players from the Spinto Bands, his uncle had a studio there and we made a song. And I really, I always really loved this song. Uh, I have a soft spot in my heart for it. So if I can find it, I'll put it in the description. Uh, memories, nice memories. Incidentally, you can hear a lot of my old songs uh, on Song Fight. I'll put a link. Okay, David, we are, we got a few more left here. David Eric Ramos uh, wants to know about some songwriting tips. You know, the number one songwriting tip, and this is the thing, is like, it might feel like a cop-out, but it's actually really true is just sitting down and doing it. There's nothing better that you can do than just sitting down every single day and forcing yourself to write. I recognize how difficult that is. Um, um, if for no reason, I mean, it's easy for me now because I've been doing it for so long. But I'm also, you know, I'm trying to write a book and that's a completely different kind of writing and I find that very difficult. And so I imagine that that's how it might feel for some of you to sit down, to try to sit down and write a song every day. The same advice applies whether you're writing a book or whether you're writing anything, any creative endeavor that you want to do. The only thing you can do is just sit down and do it every day. That is my number one piece of advice. Every other piece of advice sort of grows from that piece of advice. Skank man, McDanger boy. <laughs> Skank man, Mitch, McDanger boy, who's... <laughs> whose name is actually Elliot, wants to know where my favorite place in the world. My favorite place in the world is a spot called Deep Creek, Deep Creek Hot Springs in California, in Hesperia, California. It's on the way from LA to Las Vegas, and you pull off at Barstow, and you go out a ways, you drive out a ways, and then you're in this little town called Hesperia, and then you drive out a long dirt road, and then you park in this place, and then you hike for another little while, and then you come to this amazing hot springs. That's like my, f it's just, I love it there. Um, it has like a lot of things that I love. It has like big rock formations, which I love. It has a little beach, like like they've built like a little beach that I love. It has a, a, a big, it's called Deep Creek. It has a big, deep pond creek thing in the middle and then off to the side are these hot springs so it has rocks and sand cold really cold water and really hot water it's like it's everything that you could ever want in a spot so if you live near la i highly recommend deep creek hot springs my favorite spot in the world that i've been to ryan pfeiffer wants to know any projects in the works besides the website yes i'm working on a new album if you listen to the songs that I'm going to be putting on this album, you'll get a good sense of like favorite song of day songs, songs of day songs that I feel like are, are, have a lot of meaning or are worth coming back to. And so, uh, I have been working on this album for the last year. I started it last summer, early last summer. I've been working on it in various ways for the last year. It's hard. I've been working really, really hard on it and I've been trying to approach it in a different way than I've ever approached doing it. Um, I've thrown a lot of stuff out. There's a lot of it that people are just not going to hear, which is very unusual for me. Um, and I'm trying to like find the best incarnation of each song. Um, I'm trying to like whittle each song down to its core and then find what is the best musical presentation that brings out the best parts of, of the song. It's like, I like the song. I enjoy the song as it is. And my last album was about, my last album was called um, The Arctic Mountains in Your Heart. And it was about stripping everything away and just having the songs exist on their own. And this album is about, I have these songs that on their own, I really love, but what can I do to what, how can I produce them to bring them to their full sort of bloom, their full, their full potential. So that's what I'm working on. Um, maybe someday it'll be done. 
Uh, Dominic uh, wants to know, he says, uh, I still like to see a video done live. You're writing the song, you writing the song while you're on li- YouTube live um, for like a collaborative feel. Yeah, uh, maybe someday. It's it's hard um, just finding the right time to do that. Dominic also wants to know, is there anywhere to get your merch? There's nowhere to get my merch, but in my basement, in the basement of my parents' house, are um, T-shirts and um, albums from when I reached 1,000 days. And I did a Kickstarter, and I made an album with the Spinto Band guys. Uh, there's some T-shirts and some albums down there. So... I guess um, if you want that stuff, you should email me and I can figure out how to get it to you. Uh, Finally, Are We Dead Yet wants to know if there's a story behind the song Shark in the Pond, which is a, let's see, what number day was that? August 21st of 2010, number 598. I did a Redux... September 16th, 2015, number 2,450. It's actually a song that I am working on putting on this next record. So it's sort of funny that you, funny that these two questions came. Yes, there's a story behind that song, Shark in the Pond. I really like that song a lot. It's about, it's a, it's a sort of literal uh, telling of a story, of some stories from my childhood. We had a pond in our backyard and I have a very clear memory of being three or four and like seeing a like shark fin in the pond, which of course is impossible. And then also I talk about Camel's Hump, which is a famous mountain in Vermont. You know, I, I always sort of had this like childhood fantasy because the pond was sort of shaped like a giant hoof print so i imagined that this that camel's hump which is like these two big humps was like a giant camel that came walking through the landscape and like made a big indentation in our backyard even once i knew once i was old enough you know eight, nine, ten, you know, found out that the pond was man-made, that my dad actually made the pond, I still sort of harbored this fantasy that it was a hoofprint. I talk about watching my brother play video games and how I would always watch him, but he would never watch me, and that always, like, hurt my feelings. In the redux of the song, I go into a little bit more. I talk about, in the version that I did in 2015, I talk about having a tape i was like i would i would listen to the radio to try to record songs off the radio that i wanted to hear this is what we had to do back uh, back in my day and so i'd w- listen for like weird al um i'm fat i'm fat i'm fat i love that song i love michael jackson i love that parody i would listen for him to come on and i would try to record it oh yeah like there's another memory of there's a big rock formation i love rock formations like i said behind in the woods behind my house it was giant of course to me as a little kid it seemed giant i was convinced that there must be a cave somewhere because i don't know why i just thought that there would be and so i would go out there for like hours like like just trying to find the entrance to this cave it's funny because if you read about when miyamoto was making zelda the inspiration for it a lot of it came from exploring his natural environment as a kid and he came across he like would go and go through the woods and come across this giant lake and and you know and caves and things and that's what gave us the original incarnation of Zelda and it's funny how i'm pretty sure that like my my sense that there must be a cave out here had to do with having played Zelda and the feeling of exploration there and how that would had to lead to some kind of cave. Those are the questions. If you have more questions, leave them as comments on this video. I have a very busy rest of my week uh, and next week, so I'm not sure when I'm going to have time to, to, to do another one of these. I'm going to... Uh, Toronto on Thursday, and then it looks like I might be going to Atlanta on Monday or Tuesday. But uh, this is fun, so keep leaving me questions. Again, if you can afford it, I know many of you can't, but if you can, donating on Patreon really, really helps me a lot. Okay, guys. Okay. Love you guys.